Good evening, I'm Kelly Ring. And I'm Frank Robertson. Welcome to Desert Shield, the Bay Area Connection. Kelly just returned from a four-day journey to Saudi Arabia. The trip arranged by MacDill Air Force Base, which also happens to be the home of Central Command, the headquarters element of Operation Desert Shield. Thousands of servicemen and women from the Bay Area are deployed to the Middle East, and our mission tonight is to take you there, to show you what it is like for our troops to wear a camouflage outfit in 115 degree heat, what it's like for them to be so far away from home that it cost $5 a minute for a phone call, what it's like to wonder whether you'll be firing your weapon at Iraqi soldiers tomorrow or whether you'll make it home alive. Sunrise at 38,000 feet from the flight deck of an eastbound American military transport. From here, it is easy to forget, at least for a moment, the danger that lurks just over the horizon, the danger that is war in waiting for hundreds of thousands of young Americans far from home. We don't like being here, but we're just here to do our job and do it well and get out of here and go home. We don't have any more on that 82nd incident that uh, No, sir. He is known as the Sink, the Commander-in-Chief. The buck stopped with this barrel-chested four-star from Tampa, General Norman Schwarzkopf. His troops call him Storm and Norman. I think that the people that work for me understand that, that I will always try and accomplish that min mission with the absolute minimum loss of human life. And that one single loss, the, the loss of one single life is very, very important to me. And we've got a breeze today. In the desert, a new generation of Americans drawing a line in the Arabian sand, bag by bag, water bottle by water bottle, day by day. Watch your head. All right, move forward a little bit. They may be here to defend the Saudis, but they have no delusions about the price they might have to pay, keeping President Bush's promise to drive Iraq Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. We've got the best army in the world. We've got the best equipment and everything else. And Hussein just gave us enough time to get everything we wanted to over here. So if he wanted to do anything, he should have done it a long time ago. Because now we're ready for just about anything he could actually muster up. Okay, let it go. And it's no longer a man's army, an irony in Saudi Arabia where women only recently got the right to ride in the front seat of a car, no less handle an M16. You're not really supposed to make eye contact with the men and things that are real different from what we learn in the military to be assertive women. I put it right next to Baker 11. With their resolve, their bravado, they've also brought the best of the American technology from the AWACS radar planes to the Patriot ground-to-air missiles. Many of the weapons, like most of the troops, untested in combat, unproven in a desert war. I've been in a Marine for 29 years, and, and we've gone through a lot of crises. Vietnam, I was involved in Beirut, for example, and I thought I'd seen everything, but this has been the most enormous experience. I mean, it's almost, uh, I have no measuring stick to be able to have predicted what we've done in the last 40 days in terms of from a standing start, moving 150,000 plus troops 7,000 miles by air, 12,000 by sea, and are now in a position where we can fight the Iraqis and fight them darn well. It's an M60 machine gun. Ma effective, maximum effective range is 1,100 meters. It's a very powerful weapon. Good. Could really hurt someone with it. Army reserves from the Tampa Bay area may soon replace these combat military police patrolling an airbase where to tell you only is somewhere in Saudi Arabia. There's a wrist film on a gentleman who actually fell off a plane earlier today. And war zones, of course, are not without their angels of mercy. These x-ray technicians, doctors and nurses come from MacDill Air Force Base. Their pride in this air mobile surgical hospital starts with the hand lettered sign over the front door. Does this hurt you at all? Okay. They feel pretty the sprains, the sick stomachs, a respite from the wounded, war most certainly will bring. If, God forbid, the bullet should fly, we're fully prepared to take care of the patients that would come through. Mail from home, the lifeblood of a soldier's morale. And he's writing in his English class, and he says, I know it's hot at least over 100.
a shipment of letters from Tampa school children. It makes me tremble inside. Yeah, it's really nice. How are you holding up? Pretty good. Yeah, I miss home. Morales indeed seems high over there, Kelly. Do you get the sense that they all feel that they're there for a just cause? Some critics in this country say we're there only because of the oil problem. Uh, in fact, when soldiers that we talk to hear that, they get angry. And in fact, the top officers uh, we talked to, we mentioned that aspect, and they did not like to hear that at all and said there's uh, much more to this buildup than that, and we're going to hear from them just a little later. We'll be right back. With the searing hot sun beating down on their backs, U.S. soldiers dig in in the Arabian Desert. We'll take you to the front line next on Desert Shield, the Bay Area Connection. So since we're here, might as well make the best of it. I'd like to say hi to my, my wife, Sharon, and my children, uh, Lisa, Scott, and Ben, living in Valrico. I'd like to say to all, hi to all my family in Valrico. My son Kenneth is a great soccer player, and my wife Kathy. I'd like to say hello to my family, to my wife and my daughter Nicole, as well as my mother back home. Hope to see you soon. Mom, Cindy, Phyllis, the rest of the family, I'm doing all right. I hope to be home soon. We've heard a lot of talk about how hot it is in Saudi Arabia. It's nothing like the heat here in Florida. There is no humidity. Instead, it's the kind of heat that dries out your throat and your nose and causes the sweat on your back to evaporate before you even know you're perspiring. But our soldiers are coping because they're ordered to carry water with them everywhere. In this next story, we take you as close they allowed us to go to the front lines in Saudi Arabia. This is the Saudi Arabian desert. <laughs> the sand is a rich caramel colored brown. Even rocky in places. Far from what we see on our beaches at home. Breathe real nice. Mother Nature doesn't provide shade. You must make your own. <laughs> In fact, these soldiers say they haven't seen a cloud in the sky since they've been here. Sergeant Russell Glenn and his men spent this day loading sandbags. When we first came over here, we heard more horror stories. I got over here a little bit later than the rest of the crew. They were telling me about 130 or so. And right here, this is kind of comfortable for us. <laughs> Comfortable because they know it's their job and it must get done, but the sand and the sun make it hard. One of the biggest problems the soldiers are having in Saudi Arabia is the sand. It is so fine, much finer than what we have at home. In fact, it's ending up getting in everything, even something as small as a buttonhole. The sand also gets in the water bottles, but the troops drink it anyway. They must. In the Saudi desert, it's become more important than even the guns. Yet it often gets so hot out here that the water starts boiling. That's why they call the sun the microwave. But you won't hear much complaining out here. So since we're here, might as well make the best of it. Two beers a day for the average soldier. Just two, just two. They pass the time talking about things back home, women, sports, and beer. Yep, 300,000 cans of beer a day they're losing out. They need to talk to these Saudi Arabians. And then about another 100,000 for me, so. <laughs> but that's not the only things they discuss. In fact, a shooting war is something they all fear but are afraid to talk about. Uh, it's always on our minds, you know. We have to prepare for it. All we can figure is if that happens to, to uh, you know, develop, we've got the best army in the world. One reason they feel they're ready is because of weapons like this, a Patriot missile, one of the U.S. military's primary defense systems. It's designed to shoot down just about anything the Iraqis may lob our way, including Scud missiles. Captain Pete Loeb's is in charge here. Uh, any air threat that comes in this area, we're, uh, we, we're set up to deal with. We do look at contingencies, uh, some ways that they could possibly sneak through, which are not, not many. And we, uh, we do have Stinger along with us to help out in those areas. But if, God forbid, chemical warfare does break out, the soldiers are ready for that too, at least technically. 
you got to do is you got to have the confidence in the, um, in the equipment that you do have. That way, it helps you a little. As far as a lot of the people haven't seen the effects that um, nerve agent or some of the uh, mustard agents that they have here can do to you. And I can tell them that in my classes that I give them or in the training that I give them, but uh, they haven't really seen it on a real person or seeing your buddy laying there with it on him. We should point out those rather gruesome scenes of the result of chemical warfare in Iraq. As you know, as you've heard, Saddam Hussein has used chemical weaponry against his own people, those who disagree with him. Kelly, I wanted to ask you about uh, the long haul. Are these soldiers who are there now prepared to stay for quite a while? Um, best way I can explain that is to tell you about uh, Christmas decorations that are already going up. Uh, they think that they're going to be there at least through Christmas. Uh, many of them don't want to be, but uh, right now they've been given no indication that it's going to be ending anytime soon. And President Bush has mentioned the possibility of going over for Thanksgiving. November, right. yeah. We'll be right back. In a shooting war, an outfit like this often is the last a soldier sees before going home. There's no shooting now, but they're ready anyway. When we come back inside MacDill's mobile surgical unit, part of Desert Shield, the Bay Area Connection. Hey, hi, Daddy. It's uh, me. I'm in Saudi Arabia, and I just want to say hello and that everything's okay over here and I miss you very much. Hi, I'm Staff Sergeant Mark Pollard here in Saudi Arabia. I'd like to say hello to my parents, Frank and Cookie Pollard in North Fort Myers, Florida. I miss you mom and dad, love you, I hope to see you real soon. I'd like to say uh, hello to Lynn, Corey and Sarah and uh, looking forward to getting back there as soon as we can. I miss my family, uh, Ruth and Michael and Catherine, Matthew and Eric and I uh, hope to be back home soon. It has been nearly seven weeks since President Bush first decided to send troops into Saudi Arabia. And from the very first moment the soldiers stepped on the desert sand, the region has been poised at least for war. But Kelly, to get the feeling in talking to these people, they think it's just around the corner. It's going to happen. They want something to happen. The worst thing for them would just to be sitting around with nothing going on for months and months and months. Many of them do want to fight. Most of them don't. They want to uh, get this over with and go home with uh, no shots fired at all. Well, men and women with M16 slung over their shoulders are everywhere. Already, some anxious to do what they're trained to do. Most just want to keep the peace. Combat military police among the most heavily armed American troops on the ground in Saudi Arabia. Working in teams of three out of the Army's new armored jeeps called Hummers, the MPs are much more than police. It's an M60 machine gun. Ma effective, maximum effective range is 1,100 meters. It's a very powerful weapon. Good. It really hurt someone with it. The first line of air base defense against terrorism. These MPs are also the last line between the enemy and billions of dollars worth of American radar planes. Three M16s. Yet unlike in frontline combat units, women and men serve together in the MPs. These troops were the first to land here. We're open 24 hours a day, yes, sir. A look at this air base in Saudi Arabia is a very good indication of the enormous amount of equipment the U.S. military moved in a very short amount of time to such a distant land. We started off with uh, about 30 security policemen on the ground out here, and they worked for like 18 days working 14-hour shifts, you know, just trying to get the original security established. Uh, we're still working 12-hour shifts, and those are awful long when you're standing out on the ramp and temperatures hit 110, and, and then you add the, the concrete factor, and they go up to about 125. It, it takes its toll in, in fatigue, and, uh, and it's kind of demoralizing. Get off these night shifts, everybody pretty well drinks a lot of coffee in the evening to try and get through them. 18 rounds for each 38. How many rounds did they give you all? 60 rounds, was it? Soldiers are trained to treat their weapons as their best friends, but in the desert, the weapons and ammunition share armory space with yet another essential, and that's water. They're under orders to drink three large bottles every day. 
The heat will tear you apart. If you don't drink your water, it'll dehydrate you. And the next thing you know, you could be in the hospital or else possibly. At least the hospital is air conditioned. An ingenious array of canvas air ducts inside a state of the art hospital flown in from MacDill Air Force Base in Tampa and set up literally overnight. This entire hospital is collapsible and quickly constructible. We're tasked to be able to go anywhere in the world and put it up in 24 hours. We can also take it down in 24 hours, get on an airplane, and go anywhere we want to. It is huge, 270 feet long by 250 feet wide, self-supporting with operating rooms and an x-ray lab. Can you make a fist? Good. The only patient in the hospital when I visited was an airman who sprained his wrist in a fall. There are um, problems with their stomach. They have a lot of diarrhea, um, nausea and vomiting, stuff like that. The heat and the local water aren't the only threats. There is also the psychological stress. Dr. Dennis Kennedy is the hospital staff psychiatrist. Oh, uh, people have difficulty sleeping, sadness, homesickness. So is there one bit of advice you're giving to soldiers? Mostly to hang in there. We're all in it together. And uh, so there's a lot of camaraderie. We emphasize that. Camaraderie was easy to find among the MacDill Medical Corps here, and the talk, of course, was of going home. Just want to go home together, that's all. Yes. And alive, yeah. What do you like about <laughs> Well, Kelly, I know that, that most of the troops went over in transport planes, big transport planes. Now, the media pool that you traveled with, how did you get over there? We experienced the same thing. We rode over in a C-141 transport plane, and on the way over there, there were four vehicles inside the cargo plane, and that was uh, where we slept. Uh, but many, but on the way home, that wasn't the case. The plane was entirely empty, as you can see, except for the eight members of our pool and about a half dozen soldiers who were lucky enough to get to come home. The plane gets very cold at 38,000 feet, so just like the soldiers, we did try to sleep a little bit, but that was easier said than done very long ride. You said it, you felt like you'd never get home. I felt like that. It was 24 hours, uh, really 25 almost hours to get there and to get back and we made a few stops but it was um, it was long. It was worth it though. Oh. I wouldn't take anything back. More in a moment. They say that an army travels on its stomach. Coming up next, we'll show you how our troops eat, sleep, and spend their time in the Middle East. As Desert Shield, the Bay Area connection continues. Spoiling our troops over here. Yeah, we have it so good, it's great. Uh, mommy, it'll be a long journey. It'll be a long wait before I get to come home, but I'm all right. I'm Captain Valerie Rose, and I'd like to say hello to Jay, and that I love you, and I'd like to see you again soon. My name is Staff Sergeant Daniel Chandler in Saudi Arabia. I'd like to say hello to my family and friends in McDill Air Force Base. Hi, my name is Barbara Stockton, and I'm in Saudi Arabia. I'd like to say hello to all the friends uh, at 37th AG. Hello, Colonel. And uh, also my five sisters, Daisy, Jackie, Bessie, Nadie, and Dolores, and my brother Bernard. I love you all, and I miss you. Hi, I'm Janie Johnson. I'm in Saudi Arabia. I would like to tell everyone hello back in St. Pete, the 37th AG, and to tell Bayfront Medical Center they should join us. <laughs> Saudi Arabia is nine time zones away from us and a galaxy away in terms of culture. Islamic countries such as Saudi Arabia have standards that most of us would consider strange and even unsettling. For instance, there is a religious police force that patrols the cities looking for people who violate the Islamic laws. Even the wrong kind of glance or touch could result in death. The religious police cut off hands for much less. But it's their religion and it is to a Muslim society nothing is more important. In this next report, we show you how the U.S. military has come into such a different culture and tried to make our soldiers feel comfortable. Grilled hamburgers and hot dogs, no better symbol to show America has arrived in Saudi Arabia. Their usual selection, box lunches or MREs. They're uh, getting ready to prepare the evening meal. We don't serve a hot meal at lunch. We have two hots and a cold. The troops don't seem to be missing out on many meals. As one soldier put it, this isn't Chateaubriand, but most of the people here wouldn't know the difference anyway. We're going to be going to uh, Chuck, Chuck and Jose's, and we'll be having lunch there. 
At Chuck and Jose's, you get box lunches. You also get something a lot more important to these people, free phone calls to home. They're morale calls. Sometimes the wait is three hours or more. Now, as for sleeping arrangements, welcome to Tent City, a community where the housing looks like building blocks. Most of the soldiers now stationed in Saudi Arabia live in units much like this. The only problem here, a mosque next door. Five times a day, every day, this is what our soldiers hear. But for pilot Dennis Deshay and his colleagues, that's the least of their problems. We've had as many as 10 in here when we had a population up to 1,500, but again, you can see the temperature's not bad. No, the temperature's good. Is when that we... where you sleep back here? The military tries to make it as homey as possible, but that's hard when cots are such a rare commodity. This is the bedroom, We're right? spoiling our troops over here. Yeah, we have it so good, it's great. At least the units are air conditioned, a chance to escape the sweltering heat if only for a moment, a chance to stretch out and read the treasured letters from home. From my wife and grandparents and parents and aunts and uncles I haven't heard from in about four years. Because they knew you were in Saudi Arabia? Yeah, it seems to be the popular thing to do. So we, we appreciate it. Yeah. Since phone calls to the states cost about $5 every minute, letters like this are the only constant leak to families back home, a lifeline without which many could not survive. We've seen cakes, we've seen cookies, some delicatessen sent us two boxes of <laughs> peanut butter cookies. This is the central post office in Saudi Arabia. Two and a half tons of mail arrive here every day. Major Michael Whitaker is in charge of getting the letters and parcels to the right place. They've gotten, as I travel around, I see Polaroid pictures of, of uh, kids or of uh, women or guys. And I see drawings, crayon drawings. I see, come in, Thousands of letters and care packages marked to any soldier or sailor, a welcome sight. Any service member, and this is uh, $5 worth of baked goods. God bless you, perishables. Any service member, this is needlework. This one here, Kool-Aid. That's a no-no. We prefer they did, and I won't tell anybody they can't send it, but I know it makes it difficult for USPS if the, if the package does break open, it gets into the automatic sorter, it gets into the automatic uh, canceling machines, it can make it difficult for them. So the major's advice, don't send Kool-Aid and don't send pictures of women in anything revealing. According to Islamic law, that is pornography and not allowed in this country. If they get uh, pictures of women for example, if you were to send, if a wife were to send her husband a picture of her in a bikini in a box that was open, she might very well find the picture was blackened from the neck down. Okay? They wouldn't take the picture, they wouldn't cut up the picture, they just merely block it. These women are all from the Bay Area, reservists, part of the 37th Air Medical Evacuation Unit. They're reading letters from elementary kids back home. I hope you don't go too far. P.S. When you get out of it, look me up, sincerely. So nice. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> Dear service member, hey guy, thanks for sitting in the hot sun for us people in America. Hope you come out safe. You people got a raw deal guarding desert land. Too bad you couldn't go somewhere where the weather is 60 degrees. It's, it makes me tremble inside. Yeah, it's really nice. It's nice to hear. Do you visualize in your mind's eye that little child? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How are you holding on? Pretty good. Yeah, I miss home. It is easy to get homesick in a place that's so strange, in a place where all the ordinary things in life just vanish. For instance, in this Arab world, men and women can't even exchange glances in public. It's illegal. And there is no alcohol, not even on the basis. The troops do not like it. The beer would really calm me down sometimes. It just tastes good to have something to drink. Well, if being on the receiving end of a letter from home is comforting to the troops overseas, it's also therapeutic for those doing the writing here at home. To some extent, military husbands and wives are prepared to see their mates sent anywhere in the world, but the adjustment is a little more difficult for younger members of the family. And that is why the children of our forces in Saudi Arabia are being encouraged to express themselves with the written word. Dear Sergeant Brown, we'll be thinking about the time zones, the climate, the temperature. I bet it's real hot there in Saudi. We'll be thinking about the rivers and unusual customs that they're having in Saudi Arabia. Are they friendly? Do they speak a different language? I want you to ask them questions concerning that in your letters today. 
It's a lesson in correspondence, a lesson in geography, and a lesson in patience for some fifth graders whose parents are very far away. Most of the children at Tinker School are military dependents. Many of them have parents there, both fathers and or mothers. Dear Dad, I miss you like crazy. It's almost a month since Brooke Skinner's seen her father. I miss him a lot, and I wish he was back. And my mom said that she misses his cooking. She's smiling now. But this is what went through Brooke's mind when her dad left. That I was never going to see him again. And as she writes, she thinks. Some people could die if it got really hot. We encourage them to talk about this. Principal Jean Leone encourages the letter writing. She believes the children's fears are lessened by knowing a faraway parent will cherish every word on paper. Letters that will probably be more appreciated than these children will ever know. The letter is something tangible, you know, that they can kind of hold on to. It's hard for my mom and my brother and me. Misty Brown's trying to be brave. Fifth graders whose parents are still home are helping by writing letters to their classmates' moms and dads. If we did this, they kind of feel proud of themselves that they're doing this for, our, for um, another country in our country. In the letters, they sympathize with the desert conditions. No air conditioning, stuff like that. And they got to um, go, go, go to war. And they write words of support. I am writing you this letter so you would get some mail. All the people in my group are writing to you, too. We have little buttons that say we support Desert Shield. Christy Kirkmeyer hopes the letters from her class will ease the homesick feelings her father expresses in his letters. He says that he misses me a lot and he wishes he was home to um, be with us. Their final words most certainly will help. Hope you come home soon, Dad. Love, Misty Brown. I miss you a lot and I wish you were home. I love you. Words of comfort, I'm sure, to the people you talk to overseas. In fact, that uh, meant more to the soldiers than anything else that they could actually get, and that's those letters. It was so important to them. In fact, I think now we do have an address that uh, you can jot down right now. And if you don't have a loved one over there, you can write to any soldier, airman, or sailor. And the address that you need to write the letter or the parcel or whatever you want to send is Operation Desert Shield, APO, New York, New York, 09848. It really is uh, it's something very important to them. Uh, let's talk about the cuisine over there. You brought a sampling <laughs> yes, back. Yes, I did. You, right? We're going to try to open this right now on air live, and I'm not sure. I uh, did not eat one of these. I ate box lunches because I felt like that might be a little better. So I don't know what's in here and what it looks like. but uh, Chicken a la king, it says on the box, but uh, sure doesn't bear any resemblance. <laughs> it's not obvious. No. This is something you mix with hot water. Is that how it's uh, activated? You can put it in the microwave. Uh, right. Brian Brewer from WFLA Radio uh, was high on these. He thought mm -hmm. they were great and and used ate them quite a bit on the flight over there especially and he said that you just heat them up and they taste okay you don't have to heat them up in fact uh, they can be used anytime in the middle of, of nowhere this is still <laughs> this is fruitcake now that's not popular under any circumstances no. I wonder about this, this military is, version uh, of it the cocoa beverage powder and uh, what's this uh, the sauce that goes on the chicken a la king yeah amazing <laughs> coffee Mighty cream substitute sugar salt all kinds of stuff in there amazing luckily they didn't have to eat too many of those, but many of the soldiers liked them. Okay. We'll continue in just a moment. The role of women in the U.S. Army has brought them from the sidelines to the front lines. But serving in an Arab country puts a special strain on America's fighting women. You'll see why when we return to Desert Shield, the Bay Area Connection. Sharon Christ. I'm from Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland, and I'd like to say hello to my grandmother, Caroline Wisniewski, who lives in Brooksville, Florida. Thanks. Hi, Grandma. I'm doing fine. I'm Master Sergeant Anne Marie Creighton. I'm in Saudi Arabia. I'd like to uh, say to my husband, I love you and I miss you, and especially to my daughter Tiffany. I love you, Tiff, and I really miss you, and be good in school, okay? Bye. Operation Desert Shield has a nickname. The soldiers over there call it the Mom's War. 
That is because for the first time ever, women are working side by side with the men. It's an ironic twist that is happening in a country that still will not let its women drive a car. And just six years ago, the king gave women the right to ride in the front seat of the car. Perhaps the best way to describe the role of women is to tell you what happened the day we left Saudi Arabia. In Judgment Square, Friday afternoon, a woman was stoned to death for committing adultery. Anyone who wanted to watch could, and were told it was not uncommon. That's why the military has given female soldiers a booklet to make sure they know what is right and what is wrong. This military buildup is like no other in history. At a time when American military women are finally close to the front lines, they find themselves in a country that considers them second-class citizens. We're not used to it by any means. We're adjusting and we're dealing with it, but it's not like back home. Tech Sergeant Lorraine Prevo is a paramedic from Tampa. She writes a letter home talking about the way women are treated in Saudi Arabia. She can't drive here, can't touch a man, and can't expose any part of her skin. We have uh, toured some of the cities, some of the downtown areas. We find the women are very, very nice and polite. They will say hello to us. Uh, we do wear the abayas, that's the official dress, and the veils. And we're abiding to the customs when we're with their people. And it's a little bit uh, constraining and refining, but we're managing. And this is what is called an abaya. It is what the Saudi women wear when they go out in public. And in fact, the American female soldiers have been told they must wear one when they go out among the Saudi people. Lieutenant Elizabeth Vinton has access to an abaya, as do all the women soldiers. She is a nurse with the unit that runs the Air Medical Transport Hospital. In America, she says, women are taught to be strong. Weakness does not come easy. You, know, you kind of feel paranoid at first because you really don't want to make any mistakes with their culture and it's real different especially with women and so you're you know at first you're real timid not knowing because you're not really supposed to make eye contact with the men and things that are real different from what we learn in the military to be assertive women and so everything kind of turns around a little bit. We were not allowed to take pictures of the Saudi women and most Saudi men would not talk to us but this man was quite friendly. He's a businessman who cannot speak English. We spoke with him through an interpreter. Uh, he's happy from the American, of the presence of American here. Does it make the Saudi people feel safer? Uh, yes, that makes the Saudi people feel uh, more comfortable uh, because of the presence of American here. But Salih Atiyah al zakroni told me he would not talk about his country's culture, his country's women too personal, he said. I wonder if we're going to get our picnic when we get back. Most American women soldiers don't really understand this Arab culture, and many don't care to. In fact, they use humor as a way to cope. This group of reservists from the Bay Area has come up with some enterprising ways to remember their experience here. We'll all hit the NCO club in our, uh, what do you call those, abayas? Abayas. Yeah. We'll go to the NCO club. <laughs> and then we'll have a beauty contest for the 37th yeah. with the you. <laughs> The precise number of women serving in Operation Desert Shield is classified, but there are thousands holding down every conceivable job. Captain Valerie Rose was the very first woman to arrive at the Central Command Headquarters in Riyadh, the capital of Saudi Arabia, the first woman to greet surprise Saudi soldiers. No, no women had ever uh, deployed as part of a force to, to this uh, theater of operations before, and, and we just weren't sure how, how what the reactions were going to be. The captain is glad they've accepted women. It makes her job a lot easier since she gives briefings to high-level officers. Seeing this culture makes her so thankful to be an American. Um, it never occurred to me once that I couldn't be a, an officer in the American military because that's something that's, that's um, been an enjoyed privilege in our country for years. And to suddenly be in a culture where you don't necessarily have the freedom to, to pick and choose your career. Makes you more appreciative of, of what we do have. For Master Sergeant Anne Marie Creighton, this takes an even tougher twist. She left a seven year old daughter, Tiffany, behind. Her husband is also in the military, and he too may soon be called. And then Tiffany must live with neighbors. The other day, I got a letter from her with a fill in the blanks, and uh, you know, she wants me to answer these questions. So she writes, When will you be back? Blank. 
will you be back? Blank. And so I gave it to the colonel. I said, you answer this. I can't answer this. I messed with my can't stand that part of it. My heart is there. And that's, that's the only thing that really kills me, is to know that she's back there and he's back there and I'm here. And she wanted to send a message home to her daughter. I love you, Tiff, and I really miss you. And be good in school, OK? Bye. And that is perhaps the hardest part of the so-called mom's war, is sure. seeing um, all the people over there, the, the mothers, having to leave their very young children behind and not know when they're going to get to go home. Let me ask you about the, the arrangement there. Do they have to go into town, or is it it's an option, obviously, to go into town, but uh, they go stir-crazy if they don't get off their, their base? Um, they're working such long hours right now, uh, since it's still kind of new, that they're not even really having time to go out in, into the city. But it's an interesting culture, and many people want to see that sure. and learn about it. So they're going out some, but not a lot. And the, the soldier, the military, has not told them they had to wear the black abaya. But it's suggested because it would make it a lot easier when they go out among the people. Sure. You don't want to offend uh, right. the Saudis. Mm -hmm. We'll have more in just a moment. <laughs> Leading an army in the 90s is a different ball game from any before. We'll take you inside the high-tech center where the coaches run that game, the nerve center of Desert Shield, the Bay Area Connection. Hi, I'm Steph Sergeant Troy Clifton in Saudi Arabia. I'd like to say hello to my wife, Jody, at McDill Air Force Base. I love you, babe. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Scott Hyatt. I'm in uh, Saudi Arabia. Thanks to the head of my family and Brandon, my wife, Lauren, and my three kids, Scott, Danielle, and Christy. This is Captain Ron Wildermuth, United States Navy. I'm in Saudi Arabia, right here. I'm from Odessa, Florida, and I send my love to Carol, Brett, and Erica. The makeshift Central Command Headquarters in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, it's the nerve center for Operation Desert Shield. It certainly is, and for most of the people who work there, it's filled with 16 and 15 hour days with intelligence briefings, strategy sessions, page after page of paperwork. They are the lifeline to the troops in the field, and 90% of them are hometown folks. Perhaps the only place that can heat up faster than the Arabian Desert is Central Command Headquarters. Here inside a government building in Riyadh, we find the very pulse of the Persian Gulf effort. Every major decision, from battle strategy to work hours, is made in this so-called war room. Saudis sitting next to Americans, making decisions side by side. And our staff has been working 20-hour days have been routine. In fact, today is the first, second time we've had five hours off, and I'm not complaining, I'm just telling you the order of magnitude of responsibility of a staff like this and, and getting the troops in the right place and honestly be able to perform our mission given to us by the president has been a weighty responsibility. It is truly a joint effort. The Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines maintain daily contact with Tampa and Washington. Some days are smoother than others. Uh, we get up and uh, come into work uh, reasonably early. We check uh, to see what's happened the night before with respect to the, uh, the messages that have come in. Uh, of course, it's still uh, uh, the Washington day is uh, just being over as, uh, as we're getting into work and, uh, and we're waiting for, if we need to discuss things with them, we have to wait till, uh, uh, till later in the day to talk to them. The talk doesn't stop with Washington. The staff is working nonstop with the Saudis to prepare for anything they may face. We have uh, a lot of uh, our uh, military members being to the United States for different courses and uh, I think we are getting along uh, very well. No doubt the Saudis picture may be captured along with the Americans on videotape. Central Command has its own camera unit. Its main purpose is to record men in combat. But for now, it's an informational tool for the Pentagon. <laughs> 
we try to give them like a visual sit rep to match what they get in message and it makes it a lot easier for the people in the Pentagon to understand what we're trying to do here, where our problems are, why we need help in certain areas. Military leaders say they could have kept Central Command in Tampa at McDill Air Force Base. Today's technology makes that possible. But those who are drawing the lines in the sand say there's nothing like being there. It is very difficult to do that in the kind of antiseptic environment of a headquarters building. I mean, you can you can look at maps and you can try to figure out what that represents in terms of terrain, but there's nothing like seeing the terrain. To have our people that will do the planning along with our components from the other services uh, to decide how we will defend this real estate. Major General Robert Johnston says it's also vital that the troops know that their commander in chief, General Norman Schwarzkopf, is with them in more than just spirit. The morale side of it, you know, having the commander in chief visible to the troops that he's not back there in some palace, you know, sitting drinking a cup of coffee and uh, pointing big arrows. It just, it's just, it's a fund it's the philosophy I think we have of combat leadership. And that's of course where the commander in chief is and he needs to be here, it's just that simple. We could be in this thing for a long time and, and we're committed, we're here until the mission is accomplished. The key to success or failure in the Persian Gulf lies within these walls. The Central Command staff believes it has the tools and the people to weather the worst kind of storm. And Kelly, even though Central Command is based right there, and mm -hmm. obviously the soldiers you talk to are right around Central Command, they're not totally aware of what's going on in, in terms of news and information. They don't have the access we have in this country. Uh, Central Command may have the access to the information, but the soldiers out in the field don't. And that was something that they all were asking us what's going on because they want to know themselves and they really aren't told a lot. And the, and the officers want to keep it that way. Okay, one quick look at the after picture of the meal ready to eat, the chicken a la king. Back in a moment. Until a few weeks back, he was in Tampa, the general of an army on paper. Now he's the boss of a major operation, the man they call Stormin' Norman, the commander-in-chief of Desert Shield, the Bay Area Connection. I'm, I'm Norm Schwarzkopf. I'm speaking from my headquarters in Riyadh, and I would just like to say uh, uh, hello to Tampa. Hello to my family, Brenda, uh, Cindy, Jessica, Christian, the dog bear, all my friends out at Tampa Sporting Clays, all my good buddies that I go hunting and fishing with back there, and all the good people of Tampa. We really miss you. We miss you an awful lot. Uh, we're looking forward to coming home soon. And oh, by the way, I want to say to the Tampa Bay Bucks, you know, you were doing great there. Didn't do too good last weekend, but we expect you to win all the rest of them. <laughs> The best way to illustrate the Bay Area's importance in Operation Desert Shield is to introduce you to General Norman Schwarzkopf. He makes all the calls, all the decisions about troops, hardware, and tactics. He lives in Tampa, as you just heard, and just like many of his troops, left a wife, two daughters, a son, and a dog behind. Thanks, Mitty. Taking tea for a bad head a cold bad and joking about his disrupted bad social bad calendar, bad General Norman Schwarzkopf comes across as a soft giant. But as Commander-in-Chief of Operation Desert Shield, he holds the lives of 150,000-plus Americans in his hands, and his sense of purpose is as strong as his army. We're here to protect Kuwait. People say we're here for oil, and that's an argument that really, really bothers me. Uh, you know, we are not here for oil. We're here because, let's face it, it is in the best long-term interests of not only the United States of America, but the entire free world for us to be here. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't in our interest to be here. I'm sick yet. It's getting that way. The general knows that too many days spent idle in the desert sand could weaken the troops' resolve. And they get all pumped up, and then they come over here, and it is a little bit of a letdown when they find out that we're in a very stable uh, condition. But what we're doing is, is we're doing exactly the same thing we do back in the States. You know, we're keeping them busy. The general is credited with predicting this very crisis months ago. He saw Iraq's huge standing army within a stone's throw of the Saudi Arabian oil fields, and he warned Congress of the possibilities, and those possibilities became real. Still, he offers no forecast for what may happen tomorrow. So I don't predict 
all I do is make sure that we are ready for anything that he might pull off. Are you getting your milk, Stuart? And if the chance to speak to Saddam Hussein were offered, what would the general say? I probably would say, um, don't you realize the total isolation that your country is in today? You know, I, uh, don't you realize that the entire world is against you? What he does best is he appeals through demagoguery to the masses in the street. And I think he's got a lot of support there. I mean, he, you know, he's linking, he's linking the invasion of Kuwait now to the Palestinian situation, saying, I'll withdraw from Kuwait if the Israelis will withdraw from Palestine. Now, that wasn't his original argument at all. I think he is a megalomaniac that is surrounded by a bunch of yes men, and he has heard everybody tell him how magnificent his ideas are for so long that he is in incapable of comprehending the fact that something he might think or say is wrong because everybody's told it for so long it's right. Schwarzkopf says the threat of terrorism is very real, perhaps more now than ever before. We have to be very, very careful, I think, in, in looking at the uh, ultimate outcomes because we could very easily win the war and lose the peace in the Middle East. All right. The strategic importance of the Middle East is to, to the entire world is growing every year. And I think that 10 years from now, it'll be 10 times more important than it is right now. And 20 years, it'll probably be 20 times more important. Every move that we make has to be calculated in terms of 20 years out. And what is, what's the impact going to be uh, on, on that time frame, not just on today? We're kind of drawing a line saying we're not going to tolerate it. We're sending a message out there to, to not only to this particular dictator, but any other dictator out there who thinks that they're going to go ahead and conduct themselves this way. And the world's sending the message. It's not the United States. It's the world that's doing it. Before we say goodnight, I'd like to thank the people at Central Command Headquarters for setting up this media pool. Now, without them, we would never have gotten the visas to enter Saudi Arabia. We didn't get to talk to the troops on the front line, but we now have a better understanding what it's like for our local soldiers who could find themselves in a shooting war within a matter of minutes. Our media pool was just in the country for 48 hours. We got to come home quickly while the thousands of soldiers in the Middle East are not so lucky. Thanks for joining us for Operation Desert Shield, the Bay Area Connection. Good night. Thank you.